There's a running gag uh, from the movie Princess Bride. And if you haven't seen Princess Bride, I'm just curious, how many people have not seen Princess Bride? It's 37 years old, people. No, 35. It's 35 years old. It came out in 1987. It is one of the top three movies, in Pastor Jonathan's opinion, ever made. So your homework this week is get out and see Princess Bride. Uh, if you've seen Princess Bride, you will visualize exactly what I'm telling you. If you haven't, I think you'll catch enough to get the point. There's a, there's a running gag in the movie where uh, Vincini, the bad guy, he's kidnapped uh, the Princess Bride, and uh, they, they are escaping to where he's taking her. And events keep happening uh, while they're on their escape route that Vincini keeps saying are inconceivable. They're on a ship, and uh, they're uh, moving as quickly as they can, and one of his cohorts mentions that another ship is following them, and Vincini says that's inconceivable. He says nobody knows where we are, nobody knows this plan. It's just inconceivable that there could be another ship chasing us and then after a little while that other ship is catching up to him and one of his cohorts mentioned this and again Vincini says inconceivable I have the fastest ship that's known there's no way anybody could be catching up to us they they dock the ship they begin to climb uh, I think it's the cliffs of despair and as they're climbing this giant rope up there one of uh, his cohorts says uh, somebody's climbing the rope and they're gaining on us and again, Vincini says, inconceivable. I have a giant, and nobody's stronger than him or faster than him. And uh, they get up to the top, and I can't remember exactly what happens, but again, uh, somebody mentions something that's happening, and Vincini says, this is inconceivable. And finally, Inigo Montoya looks at him and says, you keep using that word. He said, I do not think that word means what you think it means. And it's a great line because everything that uh, Vincini says is inconceivable, anything he can't even imagine, uh, there's no way it's possible, is actually happening every single time to the point that Inigo Montoya finally says, I, you know, you're either using that word wrong or you don't understand what inconceivable means. We actually run into this same dilemma many times when it comes to the Word of God. We saw that last week when we looked at the paradox of faith. The world, those who are outside of the kingdom of God, those who are not followers of God, de defines faith as kind of a feeling that you have. It's not based on evidence. It's kind of a wish. It's kind of a hope-so thing. Uh, those who do not know God will often uh, criticize Christians by saying, well, you guys operate on the basis of faith. I operate on the basis of facts and, and of science. And of course we know, as we saw last week, that that's not the definition that God uses of faith at all. Faith is the conviction of things not seen. It is the assurance of things that God has done that God will do because his character is unshakable. His character is unmutable. It does not change. God cannot lie. God cannot fail. And, and so we run into uh, some paradoxes in God's Word where uh, the definition does not mean uh, what we think it means or how the world uses it. And if we're not careful, if we're not careful to hear what God is saying, we will instead understand the Bible through the world's eyes or through those who are not part of God's kingdom instead of through God's eyes. This is vitally important to our faith walk because God does not look at life in the same way we do. He declares in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8, God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. If I could paraphrase that, uh, God is saying, uh, Christian, uh, you know, disciple, understand 
that I see things from a very different perspective than you do. I see them from an eternal perspective. I know the beginning and I know the end. I am the creator. I know the purpose. And many times, things you don't understand, that's okay. I know what I'm doing. I do understand. And my thoughts are deeper, higher, and, and um, more in line with the truth than yours. And that actually should be a great comfort to us as God's children. As we've referred to many times, if everything that God did, if everything that he was about made complete sense to you, then that means God is only on your level. I'm glad that the one who spoke the universe into existence, I'm glad that the one who holds all things and sustains them in his hand has a perspective and understanding that I do not. It means that he is greater than me. It means that he is higher than me. And we should take confidence and rest in that. It makes complete sense then that if an eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing God in heaven looks at things different from us, has a different perspective, and God's different perspective results in the paradoxes that we find in his word. Statements that appear to be contradictory but are actually true. And this morning, we're going to look at another one of those paradoxes. We are going to look at the paradox of hope. To those who don't know God or who are not kingdom people, who don't share God's perspective on hope, this is how hope is defined. If you look up hope in the dictionary, you will find this. To feel or wish that something desired may happen. To feel or wish that something desired may happen. In the last couple of weeks, I'm sure a, a lot of you went through a time of hope. You were hoping, you were desiring, you were wishing that what you had asked for for Christmas or what you wanted for Christmas, uh, you would actually get that. Some of you have... Uh, some of you have hopes and desires now that uh, for your sports team or for sales coming up in the new year. Or you have hopes and desires that some things that didn't go well last year will go differently this year. That's how the world uses the term, to wish that something desired may happen. God, in his word, in his definition, God in the upside down kingdom takes that word hope and puts a very different meaning and a very different definition upon it. Biblical hope in God's word, whenever you see that word in the Bible, here's what you should think. Biblical hope is the certain, assured expectation grounded upon the sure foundation of God's word in which we look forward to and wait for with joy and confidence. That was kind of wordy. Let me summarize it for you a little bit. Biblical hope is a confident expectation that flows from faith in God of promised future events. So when you see hope in the Bible, it is always referring to something that is certain to happen, that you can bank on happening, that God says is going to happen. It's just simply in the future. It's not a wish, it's not a desire, it's not a maybe, it's not a cross your fingers. It is an event that is assured that is simply in the future and based on the truthfulness of God, the character of God, the truth of his word, you can bank on it happening. And so hope in the Bible is an excited expectancy for what we know is coming. Romans chapter 5 verses 1 through 5 is our text for this morning where it talks about hope. It talks about hope in the way that God defines it as something that is certain and expected. And let's pray as we get ready to hear God's word this morning, and then let's read it together and let it sink into our hearts and minds. Father, once again, we have uh, uh, braved the cold. We're thankful for cars that started. We're thankful uh, for good health that we could be here this morning. We're thankful for technology, those that are joining us. In the community, some even around the world, Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we can gather together once again this morning to hear your word. It's because of your word. It's because of the faith that we have in that word, the gift of faith that you have given us to know that your word is true, that your character is true, that your word has something to say to us 
And your word has something that it wants to do in us and through us. And so we pray once again this morning, Father, as we look at some of the paradoxes, some of the things in your word that don't make sense to us at first glance. Would you open our eyes? Would you open our ears? Would you soften our hearts? Would you uh, give us understanding in our minds? And most of all, Heavenly Father, help us to uh, receive that word implanted. For this is why we gather together. You have something to say, Father, and we want to hear it this morning. So speak to us, Jesus, we ask in your name. Amen. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Let's listen to how God describes hope to us in his word. Let's read together. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Can we go back to the first part of that passage, please? I want you to notice here as we look at uh, this passage, I want you to notice the progression that is happening in this passage. Paul says that we've been justified by faith. We've been saved by the fact of what Jesus Christ did through his perfect sinless life, through his substitutionary death on the cross at when he paid for our sins and then rose again three days later from the empty grave and because of that work we've been made right with God our uh, where we were off track we've now been justified and that justification has given us peace with God God no longer has a problem with us there's nothing between us and God but we're in relationship because of the work of Jesus Christ verse 2 through the work of Jesus, that we've, uh, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Grace is the basis, is the foundation of our walk with God. Not what we deserve, not what we have earned, but what God in his love so freely gives to us is grace. We stand in grace, and as we stand in grace, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not a wish. That, that God is going to, we're going to see the glory of God, that God is going to be glorified in our life. It's not a desire. It's, it's a certainty. We're rejoicing in it because we know that it is true. We know that we are being transformed, Scripture tells us, from one degree of glory to another. As God works in our lives, as the Word is implanted in our hearts, the Holy Spirit transforms our thinking. It renews us so that day by day, moment by moment, we reflect more and more the character and light of Jesus Christ. This is the work that is going on daily in the life of the believer. Verse 3 says, not only that, as if that's not enough, but we, listen to this progression, but we rejoice in our sufferings, we rejoice in our trials, we rejoice in difficulties. When, when we go through um, trials in our lives, when we go through difficulties in this world, when we experience the brokenness and, and heartache of living in a world that is damaged by sin, we actually rejoice in that because we know that God is using that to produce endurance in our life. It's a picture here of, of exercise. It's a picture of spiritual exercise. If, if you want to be in good shape physically, you need to exercise. You need to work out your muscles. And the harder you work them out, the more you suffer, the greater your endurance will be as those muscles grow and strengthen. This is just a spiritual picture of what happens physically in our body. As we go through sufferings, as we go through difficult times, and we exercise our spiritual muscles of faith by turning to God, relying in God, trusting in His Word, clinging to those promises, standing in grace, it builds up our endurance. And as endurance is built up, it produces character. That's the next step. What is character? That's another word for maturity. In this case, it's the character of Christ. 
I know who your father is. I know who your savior is. I see his love being poured out in your life. I see you being a person of grace. I see you being a person of forgiveness. So we become more and more like our heavenly father as suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character. And then notice the final stage. And character produces hope. Hope is a confident expectation that flows from faith in God of promised future events. And verse 5 says, And this hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit has been given to us. If, if we looked at hope, and if we understood it from the world's definition, those are apart from the King God, it wouldn't be at the end of this list of character qualities. It would be at the beginning, right? We hope, we cross our fingers, we wish and desire that maybe we'll grow, maybe we'll become more like Christ, maybe he will bless us, maybe we'll become more mature, and if things work out, we'll, we'll, over time we'll become more like Jesus Christ. That's, that's where the world would insert hope, where Hope is at the very beginning. We don't see it. We're wishing. We're desiring it. But here in God's kingdom, in the upside down one, he said the ultimate end of trusting in his word, of walking by faith, of living by grace, is that you become a person of hope. And again, not hope in the sense of I'm crossing my fingers and wishing that it's all going to work out, but a confident maturity that what God says he is going to do, he's going to do. And, and what is the hope here? The hope here is, is multifold. It's the hope that God is working in our lives, that he's transforming us. It is the hope that we have been saved. It is the hope that he's coming back again to receive us, to live with him, and to be part of his kingdom. And this kind of hope he says, doesn't put us to shame. We're never embarrassed by trusting and relying on God's word because his word never lets us down. His word never fails. And what he says he will do, he will do. In other words, biblical hope is a no-doubter. When the Bible talks about hope, it means that we know for sure what is coming we know for sure what's going to happen next, and we can be excited about what's happening next. We can be expecting what's happening next because we know it absolutely will take place because the nature of God ensures it. He cannot lie. He cannot fail. He cannot let us down. And so hope is the blessed assurance of something that hasn't happened yet but will indeed happen happen hope must involve something that is in the future and is as yet unseen this is what paul says in romans 8 24 a little bit later hope that is seen is no hope at all for who hopes for what they already have romans 8 24 what paul is simply saying there is that bi biblical hope is not a wish or a desire that i really hope what God says he's going to do, he's going to do. It's not that. It is the knowledge that what God says he's going to do, he's going to do. It hasn't happened yet, but I know it will. I'm confident that it will because I'm confident in the nature of God. Today happens to be the first Sunday in January. I'm sure a lot of you were aware of that as you came to church today. And maybe some of you were hoping that we would have communion this morning. You were hoping it in the sense of the world, sense of the word. You were wishing or, or desiring that we would have communion this morning. If, if you're here this morning and you're still hoping that we're going to have communion this morning, you're really not paying any attention, right? Because if you look up here, oh, the communion stuff is out. You've now seen that it's here and you know what is coming. It's still a future event, but based on the evidence, based on our track record, based on what we've done, you know that communion is coming at some point in this service, right? That's the biblical idea of hope. When we know it's coming because God said it's coming, we just haven't seen it yet, but we don't doubt it 
because we don't doubt God. You'll notice then that faith that we looked at last week and hope that we look, are looking at today are very closely tied together. As we looked at faith last week, we said it is the certainty that what God says he will do, he will do because what he, what he has done in the past has fulfilled what he said he will do. Our certainty in faith and hope is not based on our circumstances. It's not because our circumstances tell us it's going to happen. In fact, many times our circumstances tell us that what God says is going to happen is the exact opposite. We are, we are in a time, we are coming through a time of, of brokenness. This world's been broken a long time, but, but we're in a time of, of uh, viruses and pandemic and economic stuff in the world, and it, it's not really a lot of good news, is it? It's a lot of difficulty. It's a lot of, su for some people, it's real suffering, what we are going through, and to say, well, but God is in control, and God has a plan, and God is using this for our good, you have to be a person of hope. Because if we look at the circumstances, if we look at what's happening, it doesn't seem that God has a plan or God is working this out for our good. It seems like chaos and brokenness. It is only those who by faith say, I know how it appears. I know what we see, but here's what God has declared in his word. I am in control. I love you. I have a plan, and I am working all this to bring glory to me and to produce character and hope in your life. Our certainty is not in what we see. Our certainty is because of what we know about God and his unchangeable character. And so, well, faith, by its nature, has a tendency to look backwards. Faith looks back at what God has already done, and we rest in that because if he's been true to what he's already done, we can look forward. Hope is future-looking knowing that God will continue to do what he said he's going to do. So faith and hope are kind of two sides of the same coin. So when we think of hope, when you see that word in the Scripture, know that it's the opposite of wishful thinking. It's the opposite of crossing your fingers. It's a confidence in an outcome that we already know in advance, even though it has not yet happened. I experienced this a few years ago. We had... Uh, uh, there was a, a Vikings game uh, that day that I wanted to see, and I'd set up uh, my DVR to tape it. And I told, we had a potluck that day at church, and I can't remember what else was going on. And I told everybody, don't tell me anything about the game. If you're looking on your phone during the potluck, don't let me know. I don't want to know anything. I'm watching it later when I get home. I want to experience it with no knowledge. And you guys were great. Nobody said anything. Nobody told any told me anything. I was ha I was sitting at home. I was halfway through the game, you know, hour hour and a half behind uh, the live game. When a friend of mine texted me, I made the mistake of looking at my phone, and he said, "Can you believe that ending? Wasn't that unbelievable?" And I was like, "No." I texted him back and I said, I, I, I'm not even at halftime. Don't say anything more. I'll talk to you after the game. That text changed the whole game for me. Because the game, quite honestly, for my team was not going well. And as I saw things happening in the second half and the third quarter, there was a fumble that our team had. There was an interception that our team had. And normally when I'd be talking to my TV and being like, come on, I was incredibly calm because I'm like, this looks really bad. This is not good. But my friend told me the ending is awesome. And, and so it was a very strange thing when we got to the end and we pulled it out at the end and we won. I was like, yeah. That's what he told me was going to happen. That's how God wants us to live. You know, you know this. Pastors love to say this, right? 
I've read the back of the book, and we we know how it ends, and we win, right? We are more than conquerors through him who loves us. We know how it looks. Right now, sometimes it looks like we're losing. Sometimes it looks like the gospel is losing. Sometimes it looks like uh, God's kingdom is not advancing. What he wants is, is under attack, and yet we know because he's told us, because he's the eternal one, Listen, all things work out together for good, and we win. If we can have that mindset, it kind of changes how we live right, how we live life, right? All the bad things I saw on that videotape of that game did not bother me because I'm like, oh, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how this is going to turn around, but it's going to turn around. My friend told me how this ends. In God's word, he tells us uh, the begin he tells us the end even from the beginning. And so like biblical like biblical faith, hope is a fact, it's not a feeling. It's not a wish, it's not a desire, it's not an emotion. It's a fact that God has told us what is coming and we can rest in that. The confusion we run into sometimes is similar to the use of the word faith. We use the word hope in our vocabulary, both in the world's definition of the term, those who are outside the kingdom of God, which is a wishful thinking, and we also use it in the Bible's definition of hope, which is the confident expectation of a future reality. Where we need to be careful is that we don't apply the world's definition to the word of God. And that we think, oh, I'm hoping and wishing that this is all going to work out. Where we need to guard our hearts and minds and keep ourselves grounded so that we don't blur the two together is that sometimes we take the world's definition and apply it to what God says in his word. We look at the things that God says is our future, is our certain future, is our certain hope, and we treat them as if they're not certain, as if they're not set, and we don't have a confident expectation of the reality that's going to take place in the future. When we look at Hebrews chapter 11, we looked at last week in verse 1 where it says, Faith is the conviction of things not seen. It is the proof of that which we hope for. And then the rest of the chapter goes through all the Old Testament saints who by faith and hope pressed on and moved forward in spite of all the evidence they seen. Noah built an ark in spite of the fact that there'd never been a flood. Abraham went to a land that he didn't know, trusting that God had a promise for that. And so on and so on, the Old Testament saints, in hope and faith, stepped out saying, we don't see it yet, but we know it's coming. The Bible says that for some of them, they died in faith. They died in hope. The Messiah had not yet come, and yet they had complete confidence that the Messiah was coming, Jesus was coming. Biblical hope is a confident expectation that flows from faith in God of promised future events. Faith and hope are so closely related in the Bible that they work together and complement each other. Faith is a certainty. Faith is a conviction of what is true based on what has already taken place in the past. And hope is the assurance, is the confidence of what's going to take place in the future. So without faith, there can be no hope. God lists a big three in the love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13. We call 1 Corinthians 13 the love chapter. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Uh, Paul goes through love is kind and patient and gentle and he's describing love but then at the end of all that in verse 13 he says this so now faith hope and love remain or abide these three but the greatest of these is love isn't that interesting god says there's three big things in your life christian that you need to count on that you need to trust in that you need to rest in faith hope, and love. So as you walk in faith, as you confidently hope, 
And as, so as you walk in faith, confidently hope. And as you confidently hope, share God's love with everyone you come across. Amen? We have a certain, we've read the back of the book, and we win.